Welcome to Good God, Conversations That Matter About Faith and Public Life. I am your host, George Mason, and I'm so pleased to welcome back to the program for another conversation, Danielle Schroyer. Danielle is a theologian and a pastor and now a spiritual director. Uh, she's a writer and a great friend and colleague, too. So, Danielle, welcome back to Good God. Thanks so much, George. Danielle, we talked uh, in the first episode a good bit about uh, your early experiences of call, and we talked about your some of your books that you've written. I want to pursue some of those questions as well, but but you yourself have been on a journey. You were a pastor of Journey Community Church for 10 years, uh, but your your own personal journey has led you to different iterations in your understanding of your call. Can you trace those for us a little bit and how you believe you were able uh, to make different pivots along the way in your ministry? The simplest way to say that is that I felt called into ministry by a sense of God sort of yelling me into it. You know, I was like, are you sure? And I felt this very firm, like, yes, this is what you're supposed to do. And it's very strange to say, but I felt called out. I felt like God honestly yelled at me and said, I know you love this and I know you love these people, but you have to go. Um, it was honestly one of the most difficult, difficult decisions I've ever made. And it actually helped me understand that sometimes doing the right thing still really hurts. You know, I had no desire to leave. Um, that was so much of my identity and I love these people with my whole heart. I had given this church everything. Um, and I knew I was tired and I knew probably I did need to do something different, but I just didn't want to go. And I don't think I would have, if I hadn't felt that sense of, of clear, no, you have to go. <laughs> so yeah. uh, that's the, I, it will probably take my whole life to figure out why and what was going on and all of that. But the simplest thing is that I got called out. Um, and sort of entered in, into a time of, of real silence for myself. And I, I've gone 90 miles an hour since I came out of the womb. And uh, it was maybe the first time in my life that I slowed down. And um, that has ended up being really important in my development as spiritual director for me to, to know that, sure, I can go 90 miles an hour, but I also have to learn how to sit at zero. <laughs> We're going to talk more about what it means to be a spiritual director in a moment. But I, I, I just want to pause and and honor some things that you were saying about your discernment process to begin with, because I think, you know, we talk about the Christian faith as uh, one that involves a real uh, personal sense of the presence of God, the living God who is able to speak to us and spirit to spirit and to communicate with us. And then I think we get somehow to where we don't trust that. You know, that, that we, we think that we have a career path that is something that we're supposed to follow. Now, here I am talking about that, and I'm, I've been the pastor of the same church for 30 years, so I, I hope at least that I've been hearing that voice say, yes, keep doing that. But I, I do think it is easy for us, isn't it, to, uh, to make decisions more on the basis of what's expected of us by other people or by our own sense of ambition than by that still small voice. Yes. And it's funny because one of the biggest things that I think I had to work through is that I have such appreciation and respect, deep respect for pastors who stay at the same church for 30 years. And I thought, no, that's the kind of person I want to be. I want to be this like presence in the community. And I want to have stayed here and made long lasting change in people's lives and seen married them. And I want to marry their children. You know, I have so much respect for that. And for, for me to have to say, okay, some people are called to that and it's not me, you know? And so I have to, I have to really honor the people who are called to that and know that that's actually not the life I've been called to live. And um, letting go of your own expectations, what you would appreciate. Um, I think that was really hard, you know, to say, oh, I'm not going to be that person. <laughs> I'm going to be 10 years I was in the pulpit and I'm out, you know? Right. It's a very different thing. You know, Robert Capon talks, uh, talked about the, the will of God and how there's, there's sort of the cold side of the street and the sunny side of the street about this notion of the will of God. The cold side of the street is kind of, you know, sort of a, 
a, a German Gestapo, you will do what I want you to do, you know, that kind of thing. And it, it, we're just sort of supposed to capitulate. But the sunny side of the street is more about the will of God for you. That is what God wills for you, what God wants for you. And it's a more personal. It's not, it, it's not a kind of institutional thing as much as it's more a, a desire for the best you that you can offer to the world. Yes, that's exactly right. You have to do what it is your soul needs, needs the most. And you have to show up in the way that your soul is asking you to do that. And it's so often not what it is you expected, you know? Right. So how do you distinguish that from what could be a kind of, you know, pop psychology, sort of uh, do what makes you feel happy, just follow your bliss sort of thing? Yeah. I think the easy part in, in that for me was that it hurt so much. Uh. <laughs> like I knew it was the right thing because I just would never have left that church if God hadn't just yelled me out of it. You know, yes. maybe I would have, I don't know, but I think, um, I think it required that sense of, I'm going to close all these doors and I'm going to open all these doors and then you just better walk, you know? Um, and it, and all of the goodness of seeing that it's the right way to go didn't take away the pain of it. I mean, I'm still sad about it. I've, I've told God forever. I'm still always going to be a little sad that you made me do that, but I think it was the right thing. I see now what you were doing. You know, I see now that I did need to go. Um, you know, I was talking to a, a spiritual director at a Benedictine monastery on a sabbatical one time, and we were sitting there having a conversation, and I was explaining to him about, you know, some of the frustrations that I have in ministry where, you know, the, it, it's, it's not so much the big challenges, it's the, you know, it, it's, the, it's the small things, the, the being picked at, the kind of, you know, grabbing you, and you, you can't ever sort of you can never so much look at one person and have a conversation without somebody, you know, trying to, to grab you. And, and, and the guy says to me, uh, this priest, he says, uh, uh, it was a monk, I guess. Uh, but he says, so I, I hear what you're saying, but um, how is it you, you take up your cross to follow Christ in ministry? Shouldn't there be some things like that in your ministry that, are difficult for you that that make this calling uh, something that you have to sacrifice for and I'm like oh yeah there it is right yes there it is and I think that's part of the wisdom too is that doing your own soul work you know whatever that is is always going to have these aspects that um, that just chafe they chafe and that doesn't mean it's it's wrong work that just means it's human life I guess right right <laughs> Right. So here you are now in another season of life and ministry, and we've been touching on it in this conversation. Uh, and we've been using the phrase spiritual direction. You are now a spiritual director. Tell people what that is and what it isn't. <laughs> um, spiritual direction is the ancient art of companioning someone's soul. Um, so it requires deep listening and a shared hope and trust that God is at work in that person's life. And that if that person listens, they will know how to follow that, that, that guidance. Um, it's not like counseling or therapy exactly because it's a little more holistic. I'd say than that. It's definitely rooted in the spiritual first and then everything else kind of comes after. Mm -hmm. um, but of course people say, well, can I talk about this about my parents? And well, yes, like it's all connected. So it all comes up in spiritual direction, but the intention is in spiritual direction isn't to get people to feel fixed or to feel happy. Um, half of my job honestly is helping people sit with the hard stuff and just let it form them before running through it, <laughs> yeah. you know, receiving the lessons that are waiting for them in that. And so, um, it's patience and quiet and, Honestly, I think it's a lot of learning how to be human and how to be particularly Christian and human in ways that society just doesn't teach us in any way or form anymore. Do you, I mean, obviously you can't say who uh, your clients are, the people who come <laughs> to you, but would you say that a, a good percentage of them are ministers? I would say maybe... 
a third of them are ministers, okay. maybe a third to a half, depending on kind of how the, the month is going. But um, yeah, I do think that clergy people in particular, and that's traditionally been what it is, is that it actually was for priests only uh, at the beginning of all. And it's opened up to be um, not only clergy, but really anyone. So I have, you know, 25 year olds who come to me for spiritual direction, a very different things going on in their life than, than the 65 year olds who are retired and are, are facing, you know, second half of life questions. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting to, to see who shows up and is, and where they are in, in their journey and what brings them to spiritual direction. It's a very mixed bag for sure. So who, who would be the kind of person who would say, instead of going to a therapist, instead of going to a psychiatrist, instead of going to hire a business coach or a life coach yeah. or yeah. some such thing, or to ask for a mentor, I should really think about spiritual direction. Who's the kind of person that should, should call you or someone else who is trained in spiritual direction? I think it's that sense of knowing that this is a soul question, you know, there's sometimes you want to change jobs and that's really just about a career path that you're deciding. And sometimes this is about your vocation and it's, it's, it's different than figuring out the best sort of, you know, uh, most successful path forward. So a life coach will help you figure that out, but a life coach may or may not be able to help you figure out why your soul is stirring in this way and how best to listen to it to help guide you into that thing. So I think if there's an inkling um, when people reach out that they know that there is something deeply spiritual about what they're going through, whether it's grief or, um, you know, a question about a faith deconstruction or a, a change, a life change of some sort, um, they know that this is, this is a soul matter and not just a head matter. Well, um, so when we talk about spiritual direction, it, it, it seems to have been rooted more in the Catholic tradition, mm -hmm. the contemplative tradition, but it's, it's kind of uh, moved beyond that now, hasn't it? And it's, it's, it's now uh, finding its, its place in mainline Christianity and, uh, and any of the contemplative movements. Yes, it's really exploded in the last, I would say 20 particularly, but even 50 years um, like I said, part of that is that it moved beyond just clergy and it has become, you know, something that lay people have had access to, which has been really new. Mm -hmm. um, but now I think because of the change in the landscape of religion in general, um, mm -hmm. all of these spiritual but not religious people, they don't have a pastor. They don't have yeah. you to come and see on a Monday right. and say, I'm having these questions. And so, so many of them don't have a faith tradition where they have somebody to go to and they go to a spiritual director and, um, the the spiritual directors international which i'm a part of you know it's a it's a very diverse interfaith group so you can be buddhist you can be sikh you can be uh anything and and be a spiritual director and the other interesting thing is that i have a couple of people who come to me that aren't christian mm -hmm. and um of course they're okay with me being christian which is why it, it works for me to be their director but my goal isn't to proselytize them in any way it's to help them figure out um what what faithful spirituality looks like for them in their lives. And um, that's a very different role than, than being a pastor for sure. So, Well, it is. It, it, there's, it seems a little bit akin to being a, a hospital chaplain, doesn't it? And yes. Yes. It's much more like I did that for a, a little bit. And I think this is, this is much closer to that for sure. Very good. Well, I'd like to talk uh, in our second segment, um, we're going to take a break for just a moment, but I'd like to talk a little more about spiritual direction and some of the habits of the spiritual life, the practices that include prayer and a book that you wrote on that subject as well. So let's take a break and we'll come right back. Great. Thank you for tuning in to Good God. We're grateful that we get to be able to offer these conversations to you free of charge, and especially now during this time of COVID-19 that is disturbing the peace for all of us, we know that there are a lot of people and organizations that need your funding. And so we're grateful to have the funding necessary to be able to present this to you without asking you to support us at this time. Please give generously to your faith communities and also to those nonprofits that are serving to encourage us during these days. 
And we're back with Danielle Schroyer talking about spiritual direction. Uh, so spiritual direction, Danielle, is uh, really about this um, interpersonal relationship with another person uh, that is geared toward uh, the practice of the life of the soul, you might say, and discernment about uh, the nature of God's involvement in our life uh, at any given moment. Uh, but there's more than just the occasional conversation that happens with a spiritual director. There's the larger question of how to nurture the spiritual life itself, right, uh, in between these conversations. What are some of the practices that you recommend, some of the things that people can do on an ongoing basis to nurture their soul? Probably the ones I recommend the most are contemplative prayer and meditation. Um, okay only because I do think that those, those are not things we happen into in, in today's life. Maybe more now that we're all quarantined at home, there's a little more quiet in our day than there was two months ago, but um, we aren't used to settling in. We aren't used to listening and we're not used to staying with our feelings. And so um, one of the ways that we can sort of cultivate a sense of knowing about how we are and, and where we are and how we're feeling is to just slow down. So meditation is really helpful. Um, and then of course, contemplative prayer is, is the basic way that you get in, in touch with that sense of original blessing, that sense that God loves you and God is going to be ever present to you and that within you, there is this place that is anchored to God and you can get there anytime. There's no way that that, that place ever gets severed from within you. Um, you don't know that and you can't get there quite as quickly if you don't practice going there regularly. And so contemplative so, prayer. So let's that. talk about the practices themselves. I think people have just heard you talk about meditation and contemplative prayer. Uh, in, in just a really brief way, can you just say, if I wanted to meditate, if I wanted to pray contemplatively, what should I do? Yes. All right. We'll start with meditation. Um, I was trained by Tibetan Buddhists, so that's the way I'll teach you, but it's certainly not the only way. Um, pick five or 10 minutes, start with five. Sit at the edge of a chair or on the ground with your knees below your waist. Um, find a comfortable position. Keep your back upright, but not uptight, as my meditation teacher says. And you keep your eyes open, just about maybe five feet in front of you, really just a relaxed gaze. And all you're going to do is bring your attention to your breath. So um, you're not going to stop thinking. Everybody says, how do I stop thinking? Well, you for sure don't ever stop thinking. You just don't want to zoom in on it. So let your thoughts be like background noise. And you, you just want to put your breath and the feeling of your breath going in and out of your body as the main song that you're listening to. That's the, that's the frequency that you're tuning into. And um, it's frustrating at first because you, you don't know how to do it until you practice it. And so concentration is a muscle and it gets better. <laughs> so uh, that's a, a very quick intro into meditation. And, and it really does, when you meditate, it really does calm you down and, and help you feel uh, more alive, doesn't it? That, that is, when you're thinking about your breath uh, or, or, or maybe... Um, attending to it more than thinking to uh, about it. There, there is this feeling of gratitude that I think when I, when I do meditate uh, in that fashion, I just, instead of feeling like I have to justify my existence, it is just a sort of wave of gratitude that I just am living at all in this moment. Uh, and, and life is a gift. Yes. Yes. Um, I can't remember which meditation teacher said it, but it's a peaceful abiding, mm. which sounds like such a Christian thing, right? You know, right. it's a peaceful abiding. You just, you are. And in the same way that you are, you're connecting to the isness of the world and this God who is who God is, you know, right. um, the beingness of the world is what you come into contact with in meditation. So now co contemplative prayer. Yeah, so the contemplative prayer for me is different because in meditation, you're not focusing on anything but the breath, really. It's about sort of moving into that universal beingness, whereas contemplative prayer, your focus is on God and you're thinking about and abiding in your relationship with God. 
So you could take a word, um, some people use Maranatha, John Maine suggested that because it's a word we don't hear on the street. <laughs> so if you think of Maranatha as your mantra word, um, that one works pretty well. Um, but you could also just say, I am beloved or um, peace or um, faithfulness, and you can hold a word with you. And you close your eyes for this one because I think you go inward, but you do the same thing. You sit, you find five or 10 minutes, you set a timer and you allow that word to be your home base. And we should probably clarify. And, um, use that word as this way to answer you. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we were cutting out a little bit, but uh, yeah. So uh, you mentioned Maranatha and somebody might say, oh, Mara what? You know, yes. uh, yeah, so Maranatha. Maranatha uh, means come Lord Jesus in Aramaic. Right. And yeah, John Main suggested that because um, it's not a word that has a lot of mental intellectual baggage. Mm -hmm. I can't pick a word like grace because I just think of all the books I've read about grace and I start writing a paper about grace, you know. Right. So Maranatha is nice because it doesn't have all that heat to it. Yes. Very good. Well, yeah. another kind of prayer, though, is the Lord's Prayer, uh, which is a, um, you know, an ancient practice for us. Jesus taught his disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer. And you've actually written a book using the Lord's Prayer uh, as a guide. And I think it's so much fun for me to think back upon the fact that that book came out of a pilgrimage that you and I took with about, oh, 10 or so, 12 other colleagues uh, when we went to the Holy Land. Uh, yes. What year was that? About 2012 or 14? I think it was 14. I think it was 14. So. 14. It was yeah. 14. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. And so what motivated you on that trip? Uh, uh, aside from all the conversations on the bus that you and I had, but uh, <laughs> which were fun too. So fun. That was such a great trip. Just a highlight of life. Um, yeah. So I, the timing of that was so helpful because I had just stepped down from being the pastor of journey. I, I knew I was, was under contract to write a, a original blessing. Actually. Um, I had no intention of writing this book on prayer but I, I knew that I just needed to cultivate quiet. And so um, on the pilgrimage, I made this, this promise to myself that I would not pray with words. And um, what I found instead was when we were sitting in the first chapel um, there in Capernaum, I, I felt the Lord's prayer bubbling up. And I haven't really in my life had a practice of doing that. At, at least to that point, I hadn't done that regularly in my own private life. And so I thought, well, I think I'll take that as an invitation. And so I took the Lord's prayer and I prayed it everywhere we went. Um, when we stopped somewhere, every church that we stopped at, every time I had a, play, a time to sort of go off by myself and look at whatever we were, wherever we were and take a moment to pray the Lord's prayer, I did. And it ended up being such a deeply transformative experience for me. And so when I came home, I sat down, I told myself, you can't write while you're there. You can't write, which was just so hard. No books and no writing. And so when I got back, I just wanted to make sure I got it all down before right. I forgot all these feelings that I had and all these experiences I had. And um, a few days into that process, I had um, this very clear sense that it was to be shared. I don't know if you remember Carl Travis telling us that um, he had had a friend suggest to him that we should take some of it for our preaching ministry, and then we should keep some of this experience for ourselves. Do you remember that? I don't know. Yeah, so I was like, I thought, oh, this is what I'm keeping to myself, this experience of praying the Lord's Prayer. And then uh, that day in my office when I was typing it out, I thought, oh no, I'm not allowed to keep this for myself. Uh, so that's how the book came about, is um, I realized that it was, it was not meant for me to just hold, but for me to share, so. Well, you know, that reminds me a little bit of um, Rick Steves, who, of course, is uh, the, the travel guy, he is also a very committed Christian. And he really talks about how he tries to move people beyond being tourists when they go places and instead somehow get involved uh, with where they are and, uh, and move to the idea of being pilgrims. Uh, this this notion of pilgrimage, we mentioned that we went to the Holy Land, but we didn't just go on a tour of the Holy Land. It was a spiritual pilgrimage. What would you say that means uh, to be a pilgrim instead of a tourist? 
I do think that there's something about the word tourist that makes it seem like it's um, transactional. Yes. You know, you're on the outside and you're, or it's a commodity. There's this commodification in it. Mm -hmm. um, there's capitalism involved a little bit, you know, whereas pilgrim, you are, you are being invited into a different space and um, you're, you're actually saying yes to allowing that space to somehow transform you or inform you in mm. ways that might change you. Nice. And having that sense of openness, I think is a very different way of or when you are open to allowing the wisdom of that place to seep in. And it is a place where Jesus walked. And so there is something about being there in the Holy Land. And even though some of the sites are places that we would say are sort of dubious in terms of, you know, Jesus did this here or there, you know, they were they were going to be very close to wherever that was, right? And and there there was a sense that we are seeing the same Sea of Galilee. We are seeing the the same hills, the same squalls come up over the sea. We're seeing the same Jerusalem uh, on that hill, at least, if not the same Jerusalem per se. So there there were many many things that we were able to experience and say, okay, so this wasn't just an idea that someone came up with. This was like lived experience of, uh, of what it was like for Jesus himself to be on pilgrimage in a, in a way spiritually. Yes. And I, I think that's one of the gifts that I was, I received most fully is this, this uh, lived in sense of Jesus as a human, you know, mm. Um, after all those years of reading and studying Hebrew and, you know, just it's all up here in my head to walk through his hometown and think of him laughing and think of him making dinner and, you know, really mundane, everyday human things. Mm. Uh, it felt so, it felt like that got into my bones. It felt like the incarnation got into my bones during that pilgrimage in a way that it just wasn't there before. I don't know if it can be if you, if you don't go there, you know? Um, a lot of people concerned. say that when you, go, when, when you go to listen to someone preach from the Gospels, uh, if, uh, if you have been to the Holy Land, you can tell whether the preacher has been or hasn't been. <laughs> <laughs> because there is a sense it just changes your experience of the text, doesn't it? It does. It does. And I am. I have not experienced Holy Week the same since I was at Gethsemane. I mean, right. I remember how cold that marble is. I remember mm -hmm. the smell of the trees outside. Mm -hmm. You know, I, yeah. The, those those will never leave. Those right. those impressions are are just not going to be going anywhere. So, so we've talked about uh, this idea of using the Lord's Prayer as a, uh, a one of the means by which. Mean, one of the means of grace for us in terms of nurturing the spiritual life. Uh, it, someone has made this point about uh, this time in which we are living where we're washing our hands all the time. Uh, that, you know, uh, people say, well, it, you know, it should be 20 seconds, and that's about how long it takes to sing happy birthday. So sing happy birthday, right? But it's also about the, the length of time it takes to say the Lord's Prayer. So here I have been for weeks now, when I'm washing my hands, find myself saying the Lord's Prayer. And it's really a fascinating experience. How has that been for you? What's come up? Well, you know, it, it, it's one of those things. It's sort of like uh, Electia Divina in, in the sense that different words pop out to me at different times. Right. Uh, so I can go... I can just sort of string together these phrases and then all of a sudden I get stuck on forgiveness. Well, don't we always get stuck on forgiveness, <laughs> I suppose, but, but, or, or about, uh, about our daily bread, you know, and the provision of it. Uh, I, I find myself changing the word, you know, depending upon my denomination of the moment, whether I'm going to say, uh, Tres trespasses, debts, or sins, right? And just all those sorts of things are, making me more mindful of my relationship to God as I do it. Yeah. I think that was one of the strangest, most mysterious things that happened is when I came back, I had taken no notes. I was just trying to get it all down before I 
before I forgot. And I realized when I did take notes that that same thing had happened, that I had all these times when I had prayed it and this phrase had popped out or this word had popped out. And somehow by the end of the two weeks, the whole prayer had been covered. Wow. You know, yeah. like nothing got left out. And I just right. thought, well, I couldn't have planned that myself. You know, if yes. I had sat down and tried to make it happen, that just wouldn't have happened. Um, but it's funny because when I came home, I thought, well, okay, so it's one thing to feel that when I'm on the Sea of Galilee, but can I pray it in my normal life? And I remember trying to take it, you know, to carpool and huh. it just Lord's Prayer and to sort of pray it in those ways. And it was a very different experience, but but I do think you're right that these these words or moments pop out to us, these phrases that sort of inform our day. I love that idea. I'm gonna have to steal that, George. I'm gonna start praying while washing my hands. All right. Well, terrific. Well, I'm not washing my hands of you, uh, like Pontius Pilate. <laughs> I'm just grateful that you are a gift to the church and to uh, all people who are seeking to follow a spiritual path and being a great companion of the soul to us all. Thank you, Danielle, for joining me again on Good God, and God bless you in your continued ministry. Thank you so much for having me. All right.